Okay, here we go again. <coughs> All right, so these are the, the diseases that these organisms cause. M. pneumoniae causes a upper respiratory tract infection. Primarily, it presents as a tracheal bronchitis, but it can, in some cases, develop into pneumonia. Um, there is an, an association, an interesting association of this, this, this organism with chronic asthma, but the actual cause and effect has not been established. Uh, but that may be something that comes in the future. But certainly, it, it causes pneumonia and tracheal bronchitis. M. hominis. Uh, uh, poly, um, pyelonephri uh, pyelonephritis, public inflammatory disease, and in, uh, in postpartum fever. And these other two cause non gonococcal urethritis. Again, an another association here with urea plasma, with pneumonia and chronic lung disease in premature infants, in that, in just in that age group. Now, I want to point out that there are a lot of other mycoplasmas that actually uh, colonize, will colonize humans, but these are the only ones that a distinct disease association has been made for. So don't be surprised if, if you hear of other, other mycoplasmas associated with humans. It's just that we don't know if they're, what diseases they cause, if any. But these are the, the three, uh, the four that do. All right, just a little bit about the biology of these organisms that are on that side. Uh, these are the smallest free-living bacteria. Again, size is not important, but that, that gives you some idea as to what the size is. Now, it's not only that they're the smallest in size, but they also have the smallest genome size. Because what's happened is they've basically given up a lot of the genes that other bacteria have, and they have a minimum amount of genes. And there's actually been a lot of uh, academic interest in these organisms because it gives us an idea what's the minimum number of genes that that's a, a living being or a living form must have in order to be free living. And so not surprisingly, when it became possible to, to synthesize or to uh, sequence entire genomes, the mycoplasma was the, actually the first bacterium that was completely sequenced. And we know now that it's only a couple hundred seeds. I think it's like a four or five hundred genes in the mycoplasma is all it takes to be a free living uh, organism. Uh, now, it has a practical consequence, the fact that it has a small size, is that they've given up a lot of the things that other bacteria can do. And so consequently, to grow these things, they can be grown in, in, in culture, uh, but they require very complex media. And that's going to have some Im impact because obviously the, you are going to have to suspect mycoplasma infections if you're going to culture for these things and, and warn the lab because they're going to have to take special media for growing these things. There's also special transport media for these things. Uh, they are facultative anaerobes, by and large. Again, the exception in mycoplasma pneumonia is an exception in a number of cases. This is a strict aerobe, but the others are facultative anaerobes. Now, one of the distinguishing features of the, this group of organisms, the mycoplasmas, is that they lack a cell wall. Remember, Dr. Fox mentioned this as well. And again, some consequences of that. Uh, we don't typically talk about the mycoplasmas, therefore, as a, being a bacillus or a coccus, because they take, they're really p p uh, pleomorphic, because they don't have a rigid cell wall that holds some shape. They take all kinds of shapes. And you can see this is a smear of some mycoplasmas. And, and they, basically, they take all kinds of shapes because they don't have any rigid cell wall to hold any particular shape. Uh, they grow slowly by binary fission, but slowly, I mean, we're talking about a couple weeks. So this is not one that you're just going to get, you know, data from the lab. If they, It's not likely that your lab will even culture for these things, but if you were to culture these, it would take you several weeks before you can get um, data from these because they grow so slowly. Another feature of these things, they have a very unique type colony on when they're grown on agar. They're called fried eggs colonies, and I'll show you a picture of it in a second. And again, M. pneumonia is, is a little exception to this. It, they, they, those colonies have more granular appearance. But this is what the colony looks like, and it looks like a fried egg. And the reason it looks like that, what actually happens is that as this thing, as the colony grows, it burrows down into the agar toward in the center of the colony, and it's actually raised up on, on, above the surface of the rest of the colony, right in the center. And so that center is a little bit thicker, and that's why it looks like this area is a little bit darker. It, it's basically um, thicker at that point. Now, the urea plasma, 
amongst in, in this family. You may see them referred to as the T strains, or you'll see them referred to as the T strain mycoplasmas. And what that T stands for is tiny. And the reason is is that when you grow these, these this genus, the ureoplasma on tissue culture or on culture plates, they form extremely small, tiny colonies. In fact, they're, they're barely visible by the, by the naked eye. You really have to use a, at least a dissecting scope in order to just see the, uh, the colonies. So these sometimes are referred to as the T-strain mycoplasmas. I won't be using that term. I'm just giving it to you for your, own, for your own information. If you hear the term, that's what it means. Okay. Another unique feature of these organisms, if you remember right back, I think it was in the first or second lecture that Dr. Uh, Fox gave, he said, well, bacteria don't have sterols in their, in their membranes. Well, here's the exception. There's always got to be an exception, and the mycoplasmas are the exception. They do, in fact, have cholesterol in their, in their membranes. Um, they don't make that, however. What they do, and that's one of the things they require, they require uh, cholesterol in their growth medium. And so to grow these things, for example, you have to grow them in the presence of serum as a source of sterols. And then, then they incorporate the sterols in, the, in their membranes. So again, another exception about with this group of organisms. Okay, now it is possible to differentiate the species in the lab based on differences in their, in their uh, ability to grow on different uh, carbon sources. So M. pneumoniae will grow on glucose as a carbon source. Hominis can use arginine as a, as a carbon source. Ureoplasma, obviously where the name comes from, it can grow on urea. And M. genitalium, actually, it can be cultured, but it's really difficult to culture this organism, and so it's not, it's not done, basically. Now, I don't expect you to remember which, uh, which species goes with which growth uh, carbon source. Just keep in mind that the lab can distinguish these things for you based on, on their growth requirements. You don't need to worry the specifics of which ones grows on arginine, which one grows on glucose, and so on. All right. What about the pathogenesis of these organisms? As I said, the, the pathogen in this group is, is M. pneumonia. And so most of what we know about pathogenesis it actually applies to uh, M. pneumonia. And so that's the way we're going to cover it. And, and it's assumed that that these same things apply to the other mycoplasmas as well. All right, first, the epi, they have a unique type of pillus called the P1 pillus. This is one of the virulence factors. And what happens is that this P1 pillus mediates the attachment of the cells uh, to the ciliated epithelial cells. And what it does when it attaches there, it, in, in, it inhibits ciliary movement in the upper respiratory tract. Okay? And so what happens, obviously, that, that ciliary, mucociliary, uh, mucociliary elevator is there to help us keep the respiratory tract clear of, clear of debris. When, it's, when the cilia are no longer moving, what do we do to try to get rid of the debris? We cough. And so consequently, one of the characteristics of this disease is a dry type hacking cough. Uh, a, another a component of the pathogenesis of this organism is these things produce a lot of uh, reactive oxygen species, peroxides and superoxides, and they also seem to be able to inhibit catalase. Remember, catalase is the, is the enzyme that can destroy peroxide and bring it back to water and oxygen. And so they inhibit catalase, and they produce a lot of these reactive oxygen species, and so there's a lot of damage to the tissues because of, of, of these react, reactive oxygen species. And finally, there's a component of immunopathogenesis in the pathogenesis of these diseases. Uh, these organisms can activate macrophages. They also stimulate a lot of cytokine production because there's actually a superantigen associated with these organisms, at least with M. pneumonia. Again, we don't really know about the other mycoplasmas, but M. pneumonia does contain a superantigen. And of course, remember those polyclonally stimulate the T cells, okay? Uh, and there, there's, there's evidence, there's both experimental evidence and, and epidemiological evidence that would suggest that immunopathogenesis does, in fact, play a role. Um, in, in mice, if you, you take a, if you thymectomize a the mice, they're no longer susceptible to infection with, with M. pneumonia, or at least a strain of M. pneumonia that's adapted to mice. Uh, you, you graft the thymus back in, and now they become susceptible to the, the organism. 
and in, and in humans, epidemiologically, we know that, that we really get colonized. We, we get exposed to this, these organisms pretty early in life. But we don't come down disease, with disease early. It's usually later on after second or, or third exposure to this that we come down with the disease. Again, suggesting that the, the immune system had to be primed uh, before we get disease. All right, M pneumoniae. We'll start with this one. Uh, again, it primarily causes a tra tracheal bronchitis, but in a certain percentage of the cases, that can go on to develop what is a, when a, a, an atypical pneumonia. Now, what's an atypical pneumonia? The, the standard pneumonia, the typical pneumonia, usually has a very, very abrupt onset. It's very debilitating. These patients will be hospitalized, but it reco they recover with, with treatment. It, re it resolves itself fairly quickly. These atypical pneumonias are different. They come on very, very slowly. They're not very debilitating. They, they're prolonged. It may take a month or more before the, the uh, patient feels better, okay? But it's, it's not a, it's a, very, it's a much milder pneumonia, okay? And it's called, sometimes called, obviously, a walking pneumonia because these patients are not necessarily <coughs> hospitalized or anything. They, they carry on doing what they're doing. They just don't feel well. Okay. <coughs> These infections occur worldwide. There's no particular geographic distrib uh, distribution for these organisms. They're all over. Uh, and there's no seasonal variation. So the number of cases throughout the year is pretty, pretty constant. Now, if you, if you calculate the number of mycoplasma pneumonias as a, as a proportion of the pneumonias, however, then it looks like there's more of these in the, in the summer and the fall. But it's not because there's actually more mycoplasma infections in the summer or fall. It's because all the other pneumonias are actually dropping because pneumonia is typically a, a winter disease. All right? So proportionally, these things look like they're higher in the summer and the fall, but actually the number of cases is pretty much constant. But there do, do seem to be these, these peaks of, of increased activity. It seems to be on a four to eight year cycle. We get these increased number of cases uh, in, in uh, mycoplasma infections. I, this disease is spread by the aerosol route. And so um, obviously the place where you're going to see this, whenever there's confined populations, that, that's a good place for this thing to be transmitted. So where you typically see these are in school settings. College campuses, dorms are, are a great place to have this, this disease spread. Military bases, that, those are the kind of places where these, these infections are easily spread. And it's primarily a disease of the young. In, in the 5 to 20-year-old uh, range is where you get the, the peak incidence. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't become infected later on, but later on in life. But this is where there's certainly the peak of the infections are, in the 5 to 20-year-old range. When you get out to be Dr. Gaffar's age out here, you don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, <laughs> all right, these are some estimates of, of the number of, of infections in the United States per year. And they're only estimates because this is not a reportable disease, and so we really don't have good data. But it's a quite common infection, okay? We're talking about 20 million cases a year as far as infection with these organisms and disease, but this is primarily the uh, tracheobronchitis, about 2 million, about 10% of those cases go on to develop pneumonia, okay? All right, so as I said, the, predominantly it's a tracheobronchitis. 70 to 80% of the infections present as tracheobronchitis and 10% is pneumonia. But again, this is a mild disease, but it's of a, a long duration. It's the, the the atypical type pneumonia. And this actually is the organism that is the primary cause of the atypical pneumonias. We'll be talking about a number of organisms that cause atypical pneumonias, but this is probably, this is certainly the most common of those that cause atypical or walking pneumonia. All right, so let's look at the time course of the disease. There's an incubation time. Typically, it's, it's, it's a couple weeks, two to three weeks incubation time. Obviously, that depends upon the, the, the bolus of infection. Uh, how long that incubation time is, but there's going to be some incubation time. And then the onset of symptoms are very nondescript, fever, headache, malaise, and it starts about three weeks later, okay, when you get your first symptoms. And, of course, a persistent cough because of the, the paralyzing of the mucociliary, mucociliary elevator. And then about a week or so later, the respiratory symptoms start occurring. <coughs> 
And it, this is an interesting pneumonia in a, in a, in a way because in most pneumonias, the, the clinical signs of pneumonia appear prior to the rest, to the radiological signs. So you'll get, you know, in, in a pneumonia, a patient, a typical pneumonia, they'll come down, they'll be, they'll, they'll be showing clinical signs of pneumonia, and uh, you take an x-ray, and the x-ray doesn't look all that bad, but if you take an x-ray another day or a day or so later, then you see it, you can detect the pneumonia. This is just the opposite. The radiological signs actually precede the clinical signs. And so sometimes this, uh, this uh, is picked up, basically, if a patient comes in for, for some, uh, something, some procedure or something, gets a routine uh, chest x-ray, and you look at the x-ray, and you say, oh, my goodness, this, guy, this guy's got pneumonia. But he feels fine. But then in a day or so later, he'll come down with, with clinical signs of pneumonia, okay? So this is uh, a little unique in that sense. So the respiratory symptoms st uh, start. The organism, actually, if you look at when you can culture this organism from, from patients, the organism is actually present prior to the onset of symptoms, which is here, and it persists throughout the entire symptom stage, and it even persists even after the symptoms have subsided. And so, obviously, it's very difficult to try to control this type of a disease because the, the, the patients are infective before they even know they're sick, and they're still infective, uh, infectious after all their symptoms have subsided, subsided. So it's difficult to try to control this type of an infection. And you can see there's a pretty slow resolution. It, it takes a month to, to six weeks, sometimes even longer, before these patients fully recover. But it's a mild disease. It's, their, their fatality rates are very, very low. All right, how about immunity to these organisms? Complement pay, plays an important part in, in immunity to these organisms. These organisms alt, uh, activate complement by the alternative pathway and they can be lysed by complement. Uh, phagocytic cells are important. If these organisms are phagocytose, they will be ra very rapidly destroyed uh, and killed by the, by the phagocytes. And IgA antibodies are important. Obviously, this is a respiratory disease, and so it, mucosal or local immunity is going to be important in, in protection against these, these organisms. But development of delayed type hypersensitivity is actually bad. All right. And again, it speaks to the fact that it, there's, a, there's a component of immunopathogenesis in, in this disease. So development of, of, of step 4 hypersensitivity is going to actually exacerbate disease. All right, so what do you do to, to uh, diagnose this disease and how can the lab help you? All right, there's, there's several options. Microscopy, microscopy really isn't very good in, in helping to identify this organism. Because remember, it doesn't have a cell wall. In fact, it stains very, very poorly with the typical stains like the Gram stain. You won't, you won't see these organisms. But the only thing microscopy can do for you is it can help you eliminate some other possibilities. If you see other organisms in there, then you, might, you may not be dealing with a mycoplasma infection. So it can help eliminate the, the uh, other organisms, but it really, you cannot use microscopy to identify this organism. Culture is probably the, the, the best way to get your definitive diagnosis. Uh, and the samples that you'd send, of course, would be sputum. But as I said earlier, the, the sputum is, this is a, typically a dry hacking cough. It's not, you don't get a lot of sputum production. So sputum is not plentiful in this, in this type of infection. You can use throat washing, but then you, you've got also a big problem because uh, there's of the, all the normal flora that you've got to deal with. So the, the, it's problematic to, to culture these things, but it can be done. Uh, and again, as I said, these things require really special media for growth and also for transport. So if, you want, if you're going to culture for this organism, you've got to warn the lab and you've got to tell the lab to culture for this because they're going to have to use special transport medium to transport the sample to the lab and then use special growth medium in order to get them to grow. Most clinical labs are probably not going to do this. Uh, so it's culture, although that gives you the best way of absolutely identifying uh, what, what the organism is, it's not likely that most of your labs are going to culture for this thing. 
Uh, and again, it, if they do, if you do, or if you send it off to a lab that can do the culture, it's going to take a while to get the thing, get the results back, because these are slow-growing organisms. It's, it takes a couple weeks before they can grow it up. All right. So what else can you do? Serology. This is probably what you will, your lab will do for you and, and help you get the things. And because there are some, there's a complement fixation test that measures complement fixing antibodies. Uh, and this graph here shows you the, type, the, the, the curve of the complement fixing antibodies. And you can see it, it takes about four to five weeks before these antibodies are going to even begin to appear. Uh, and then they, they go up and they'll come back down. Of course, just detecting antibodies doesn't really help you because then you don't know whether or not it was a current infection or a past infection. So you really have to take a paired sa uh, samples. And typically what's done is to take a sample at the acute phase and then one in the convalescent phase and look for an increase in, in titer of those antibodies. Uh, so it's going to take you some uh, while to get the results, even if you use serology to, to help you diagnose this disease. Uh, there is another antibody that you can look for, which is referred to as a cold agglutinin. And cold agglutinins, as the name implies, are, are antibodies that agglutinate at, at, at in the cold, and you typically at four degrees, but they don't agglutinate at 37 degrees. And these, the, these cold agglutinins are directed against an antigen on, on erythrocytes called the I antigen. Uh, these are, these, looking for these antibodies can be helpful in, because these antibodies actually appear about a week or so earlier than the, the complement fixing antibodies. So it, it, you can get it a little bit earlier in, in the disease. So they're nice for that, but there are some problems with these antibodies as well. First of all, not all the patients develop those antibodies. Only about a third to two thirds of the patients will actually develop these cold agglutinins. Uh, if they do, it's great. You can, they can, it can be helpful. Uh, the other thing with it that you need to keep in mind, these cold agglutinins are not specific for M. pneumoniae. There are other diseases where these cold agglutinins occur. Uh, you see them in, in uh, infectious mononucleosis, in lymphomas. There's, there's actually a disease called cold agglutinin disease where you find these things. So these are not specific. However, if you can find cold agglutinins in a patient that has a, a, this clinical signs of a pneumonia like mycoplasma pneumonia, that's usually enough to make a presumptive diagnosis of M. pneumonia infection and, and treat based, based on that. Um, but it's not specific. There is, has, ELISA has been developed, but it's not really commercially available, so your labs aren't going to have the ELISA to, you know, to do. So basically, you're relying on, on the, the clinical picture and, and serology. You can culture in some cases, but most labs aren't going to do that. The serology is really your best choice. So what do you, how do you treat this? Tetracycline and erythromycin are the antibiotics of choice. Importantly, keep in mind, you cannot use any of the beta-lactam antibiotics. These organisms don't have a cell wall. These, so all the, the cell wall synthesis inhibitors are inactive in these organisms. Prevention, avoiding close contact. And, uh, there's no vaccine has been developed. But again, this is problematic because of the fact that the, the people are, the patients are infectious prior to the, before they even know they're, they're sick, and then they're, they're still infectious throughout the entire course, and even after the symptoms subside. So it's really difficult to try to pr prevent this. The only thing you can do, if, if you have a patient with this, you can advise them to keep, you know, and not in, in their family contacts, to keep those limited, avoiding real close contact there. Uh, but that's about all you can do. We really can't prevent this disease. Okay, the other organisms. Hominis genitalium and urolytical. We'll spend just a little bit of time on that. Again, the, the symptoms, hominis, the pyelonephritis, pelvic inflammatory disease, and postpartum fever, and the other two, the non-gonococcal urethritis. Now, we, with these organisms, we typically, we get colonized with these organisms at birth, but then we clear the infection. Uh, so, and, and then nothing happens, there's no disease. And then colonization rates go up, and you can see what the numbers are from 15, even up to 75 percent. And these, this occurs once we become sexually active, because this is essentially this is a sexually transmitted type disease. Uh, 
All right, so colonization rates go up. Now, we don't really have any good data for, for M. genitalium, again, because this is one that is very, very difficult to try to culture, and so we don't have good statistics on what the colonization rate is for these organisms. All right, diagnosis, again, the only the good way is, is, is culture, but you're not going to, again, your, most of your labs aren't going to do this for you. Uh, and again, keep in mind that gen genitalium can't be cultured. And treatment is the same. The tetracycline and erythromycin can't use those cell wall synthesis inhibitors. And the best way to try to prevent this is either abstinence or barrier protection. This is a sexually transmitted disease. And again, no vaccines are developed for any of these, these organisms. Again, I, we spent just a very little time on these because these are opportunistic infections. Uh, the, it's, the big one is the M pneumoniae. Uh, 